Hi, hello everybody, how's everybody doing out there? I hope that all of you are healthy and you have God in your spirit, in your soul, in your body, as well as your whole family. But today I'm going to be talking about diabetes, a little introduction about diabetes, diabetes. but I'm going to approach it from a different point of view. Not only I'm going to be suggesting the type of therapy or support that you need to have in order for you to have a control, but at the same time, I'm going to talk about all the wrong things that we are seeing every day in the United States. Hola, ¿cómo están todos ustedes? Hoy voy a hablar de diabetes. Voy a hacer una introducción de la diabetes, como también voy a hablar de sus enfermedades y todo lo que ocurre con esta enfermedad tan dramática y tan mala. Pero también voy a hablar de todos los errores que conllevan a una mala interpretación de cómo tratar a un paciente en diabetes, que la mayoría de doctores no están envueltos en este proceso, puesto que ellos son doctores o endocrinólogos y no son tecnólogos o flebotomistas. So, even though that I'm going to approach these from different points of view, one of the main reasons is that many doctors are unaware of what is called pre-analytical errors, the same as endocrinologists, the same as uh, family doctors, internal medical doctors. And once the blood specimen is being taken from the patient and have gone into the lab, many errors occurs there. And when the doctor receives the blood test result, it may not really be what the real patient's blood level is. And I'm going to talk about this now. Okay, guys. Vamos a escuchar todos ustedes. I'm going to be doing this bilingual, so please bear with me. Don't disconnect because it's a huge amount of people that always follow me, and they are mostly Spanish, and we have English speaking too. Laboratories lab the way that the lab where they do your blood tests are divided are set up de la forma que los laboratorios en el mundo entero están divididos o dividi o, o, o en áreas diferentes se le llama primero el área preanalítica so the first area that the lab are set up are called the pre-examination phase or the pre-analytical phase. La primera área en donde los laboratorios están divididos es el área preanalítica o la fase preanalítica. ¿Qué significa la fase preanalítica? What do I mean by pre-analytical phase? The word pre means before, and analytical refers to the analysis, the testing part. So, la primera parte significa pre, que la pre significa antes, En analítica o, o, o de examinación es donde se examina la sangre. So hay una área que pertenece a la parte antes de que se examine la sangre. So there is a phase, there is an area, there is a section within any lab that belongs to the pre-phase before the blood gets into the lab and, is, and, before, the get, and before the blood gets analyzed. And then we have the analytical or the examination phase. Y después tenemos la parte analítica o la parte de examinación, que es ya cuando la sangre llega al laboratorio y ahí se empiezan a hacer eh, los exámenes de sangre. Remember that in the analytical phase is where blood reach there or the specimen. And that's when the blood is going to start being analyzed. And lastly, we have the post-analytical phase. Y después tenemos la parte post-analítica, que ya es en esta, donde se hacen los reportes de lo que se encontró en el estudio, y se empiezan a llamar a los doctores, a mandarles los resultados a los pacientes para que sepa cuál fue su resultado. So this is the area that once everything has been done, they are going to send the test result to the doctor or to the patient, and then we, when we get the test result, now we're going to interpret these, uh, these problems, these test results. Y cuando le llegue a uno, a los doctores, 
aquí es donde nosotros vamos a, a empezar a poder leer o entender este tipo de, de resultado. Ok, and now we have to say, who really does work in the pre-analytical phase? Who really does work in the analytical phase? And who really work in the post-analytical phase? So ahora vamos a hablar de quienes trabajan en el área preanalítica, en el área analítica y en el área postanalítica. Es decir, quienes trabajan en el área antes de que la sangre se analice, quienes trabajan en el área donde la sangre se analiza y quienes trabajan en el área donde la sangre se reporta. Well, it happens to be, it is very sad, that anybody, anybody that takes blood belongs into the pre-analytical phase. Again, if there is a medical assistant, a phlebotomist, a doctor, a nurse, a surgeon, anyone, a patient care tech, anyone that have taken blood belongs in the section of the pre-examination or the pre-analytical phase. Bueno, ¿qué quiere decir esto? Que cualquier persona que trabaja en el área preanalítica, como los doctores, me refiero en el área preanalítica porque ellos, al hacer, al hacer el procedimiento de sacar la sangre, esto quiere decir cualquiera que saque sangre, como los doctores, que no están entrenados para eso, las enfermeras, que tampoco están entrenadas para eso, los asistentes médicos, que tal vez están entrenados en una forma correcta, los flebotomistas, flebotomistas, los vampiros, que tal vez están entrenados apropiadamente, la mayoría no están. En fin, cualquier persona que saque sangre está en la sección preanalítica. So, when I'm, say, when I'm saying that, that anyone that is involved in taking blood is actually related or belong to the pre-analytical phase. And I just mentioned the doctors, but doctors are not trained to draw blood. Don't believe that doctors know how to draw blood correctly. There is not a single curriculum in the United States, in the Dominican Republic, nowhere in the world, doctors are trained properly to take blood. Nurses are not trained to take blood properly. Surgeons, no. Radiologists, no. None of the doctors of these, let's say, advanced healthcare practitioners are properly educated or trained into taking blood. That goes also to the nurse practitioner. Then we have the medical assistant, that they are supposed to be trained in, in phlebotomy, following protocols and doing properly. But the majority of them are not. The same thing with phlebotomies. We wish that all phlebotomies are trained properly, but they are not trained properly. And I'm going to prove you. I'm going to say, I'm going to say that to you. And if you are with your doctor or with a nurse, ask them This is not to put them down, not at all. This is for you to understand what I'm going to bring to you and where the problems originate. You can ask your doctor, doctor, when you went to medical school, did you have a class that says phlebotomy or venipuncture, or did you just learn it in the lab or in the hospital when you were rotating there? The same thing asked the nurse, even the nurse practitioner. And I guarantee you that none of them because it's not in their curriculum to learn that. Doctors are doctors, nurses are nurses, surgeons are surgeons, radiologists are radiologists, medical assistant, phlebotomy, they are all differently. They all have things differently to do. It's not that because they are doctor and they don't know how to take blood that they are bad, no. The intention and the program of a doctor is not to take blood. The same thing for nurses. Nurses are the best in patient care. They are better providers in patient care than doctors. We doctors without nurses, we, 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 we are not. We are not complete. 
The same way nurses without phlebotomies, medical assistant, respiratory therapist, surgical assistant, and doctors, there is a whole team that have to be involved to work together and to provide good patient care and good quality care and quality specimen as we draw the blood. So, porque los doctores son doctores, las enfermeras son enfermeras, los, los cirujanos, los radiólogos, ellos tienen un trabajo específico, ellos no están ahí para sacar sangre. Por eso, en su currículum profesional académico, ninguno de ellos tiene que saber eso, porque ese no es su trabajo. Pero, desgraciadamente, ellos están envueltos en ellos, y en un momento dado, porque se supone el doctor lo sabe todo, la enfermera lo está supuesto a saber todo, ella tiene que saber cómo hacer la cosa o él. Y eso es incorrecto, puesto que cada quien hace un trabajo diferente. Now, ¿qué yo decía? What did I say? Who are the people that are involved in the pre-analytical phase? ¿Qué yo decía? ¿Quiénes son las personas que están envueltas en la parte preanalítica, en la parte que se saca la sangre antes de que se examine? Todo aquel que saque sangre, los doctores, los estudiantes de medicina, las enfermeras, los asistentes médicos clínicos, los flebotomistas, en fin, cualquier persona que saque sangre está en este nivel. All right? So anyone that takes blood belongs to the pre-analytical phase. The problem is, I'm going to show you what's the problem. The problem is that, check this out. That's the pre-analytical phase. Mira dónde está el problema. Vamos a ponerlo rápido. In the pre-analytical phase, we have errors. What? ¿Qué es lo que yo dije? Que en la parte pre-analítica tenemos errores. Es decir, it means that when the blood test comes to the doctor's hand, he already comes. That test result comes already with errors. Today now, between 68 to 92 percentage. That means that when the test result comes to the doctor's hand or the nurse practitioner, whatever says there mostly is mistaking. There are many errors and you will go like, ah, ah, please, in America? Yes, in America, in every part of the world. In the analytical phase, we have approximately a 29 percentage. And in the post-analytical phase, we have a 13 percentage. So, nosotros, en la parte preanalítica, cuando el doctor le llega la sangre, le, ya viene con un 68 a un 92% de errores preanalíticos. Es decir, que tu, el resultado no es lo que tú tienes. Cuando llega este tubo a la parte analítica, a la parte donde se examina, también ahí hay un 29% de errores preanalíticos. Y el que la va a reportar, el que va a copiar los resultados para ponerlo al otro lado, ya viene con un tercer, un 13% de error penalítico. ¿De dónde sale esta estadística? From where do I have that result, that statistics? From the Clinical and Laboratory Standard Institute. Who are they? They are the one that sets all the standards, all the guidelines all the procedures, not only for phlebotomies, but also for the lab. They cite, they enumerate what you're supposed to do once the specimen goes there, everything. So, ¿quién es el Clinical and Laboratory Standard Institute? Es la institución que le dice a los phlebotomistas, a los laboratoristas, a los tecnólogos, a los bioanalistas, cómo es que se deben hacer los exámenes de sangre, bajo qué condición, cómo se debe hacer, en qué tiempo y todo eso. Resulta ser que casi nadie en el mundo se lleva de los protocolos o de las guías. Que en las escuelas no enseñan protocolos en los Estados Unidos y en casi la mayoría del mundo completo. It happens to be that in the United States, 90%, I would say even greater than 90% of schools do not teach on their protocols. That is very sad. Okay, I took my lab coat because I'm getting hot already. Because it drives me crazy what I'm seeing now. And these errors that you see, look, I just mentioned just a few there. 
in patient identification in the order of draw. What do I mean by order of draw? That instead of taking, for example, this tube and taking this tube. I'm going to explain that later on, don't worry. So, los errores que hemos visto vienen en la identificación del paciente en el orden de extracción, es decir, cuál tubo va primero, cuál va segundo, el sacar sangre con jeringuilla, to draw blood with syringe, yes, syringe, Dominican Republic, we have everything, but still, you have a lot of people just taking blood with syringe, and that is not correct. We already know that there is a lot of pre-analytic errors. So, in my país, República Dominicana, que tú haces sangre, sangre, con jeringuilla, teniendo todo, eh, porque en mi país hay de todo, todo lo que hay aquí, esto, todo esto, los tubos, todo está allá en mi país, pero todavía siguen sacando sangre con jeringuilla. Eso da pena. All right? So, in centrifugation, in biosecurity, in creating hemolysis, in hematoma, damaging nerve, in obtaining quantity not sufficient, these, the tourniquet, the tourniquet, wrong application of the tourniquet, okay? En esto, que es el torniquete, okay? En mi país hay lugares que ni torniquete hay, lo que cogen es el guante, o cogen el tubito del suero para apretar, okay? Cuando allá está, cantidades no suficientes en el tubo, es decir, que lo que sacan un poquitito de sangre, okay? Hacen daño en el trauma, hacen trauma a los nervios, crean estos hematomas, estos moretones en el, en el brazo, cortan los glóbulos rojos, causan hemólisis, sin ellos darse cuenta, claro, ¿ok? En la centrifugación, en sacar sangre con jeringuilla, en sacar el tubo antes eh, del color que no está supuesto ahí. Todo esto, all of that creates errors. All right, so if you see here, every time there is an order of draw, let me, let, let me specify. If the doctor order a blood test that we have to take it through the vein, okay, through the vein, there is an order. Like for example, from these three tubes here, which one will go first? Okay, so it's not that you just could take whatever color tube you want to. You have, if there is an order of draw. And why is that? Well, if you see here, I don't know if you could see here, inside, inside all these tubes that are additive, that are anticoagulant, that they are either inside the walls of the tube, or they are in powder, or they are in liquid. So, estos tubos que les estoy enseñando, no es que tienen una tapita bonita para diferenciar una del otro, no tan solo no, sino que adentro tienen aditivos y anticoagulantes y agentes antiglicolíticos que paran la glicólisis, que evitan que el azúcar se queme, se pierda. ¿Ok? Y cada uno tiene algo dentro. So, uno no coge el tubo al azar. Tiene que ser en un orden para evitar una contaminación de lo que cada tubo tiene adentro, que es diferente al otro tubo. So, when we don't follow the proper order of draw, we will contaminate whatever is inside here with this here. So, for example, many people, okay, don't follow because doctors don't know, nurses don't know, and many medical assistants don't know either. They don't follow the order, the order of draw. Like, for example, this tube here that I'm going to show you later on too, we, we use it for routine chemistry. Let's say potassium. Vamos a decir que vamos a saber el nivel de potasio del paciente. Usamos este tubito que está aquí. ¿Ok? Pero, ¿qué pasa? Si yo primero cojo este tubo, but what happens? If I just take first the lavender tap tube, the lavender tap tube inside has salts of potassium. So, if the doctor wants to know the potassium level of my patient, and instead of getting these first, the phlebotomist, the doctor, the nurse took these two first, the potassium that is inside here will be transferred with the needle to this tube here. So if your potassium really in your blood is low, because now we have potassium here, as it transfers into over here, it will reach to either a normal level. So when the doctor received the test result, oh no, your potassium is fine. I thought your potassium was wrong. And that is a wrong 
test result. So, por no seguir el orden de extracción, ¿ok? Tú, tú sacas este tubo primero normalmente para los electrolitos como el potasio y después tú sacas este tubo para el, el, el conteo completo de glóbulos rojos, de glóbulos rojos y plaquetas, lo que se conoce como el complete blood count o el hemograma. Pero si tú usas este, este primero, porque aquí hay aditivo EDTA, sales de potasio, y ahora se contaminó en este tubito que lo pusiste de segundo. Ahora, el potasio de este tubo, que por ejemplo, tu potasio normal es de 3.5 a 5.5. Normally, your potassium level is between 3.5 to 5.5. But now, because in here, your blood, your potassium was, let's say, 2. Vamos a decir que tu potasio era 2. Pero ahora, cuando, cuando transferí este a este, sin darme cuenta por no seguir los protocolos, now because I didn't follow protocols, now my potassium here says, for example, 4. Ahora dice aquí, mi potasio, que el, el potasio de mi paciente está en 4, cuando en realidad estaba en 2. So, eso es un falso resultado al paciente. El doctor mira eso, y ahora el, do, el doctor piensa, wow, it was not potassium. So, when he sees that the potassium level is normal, he says, wow, it's not potassium. So, what it is? Now he's thinking about something else, another management, another blood test, another treatment. That is the problem. So, ahora por este individuo, no seguir los protocolos, contaminó el tubo, le da un resultado que no es, y ahora el doctor que pensaba que era algo específico, tiene que empezar a pensar, wow, esto no es lo que le pasa a mi paciente. ¿Qué, qué será? So, ahora tengo yo que específicamente empezar a pensar en otra condición, en otros exámenes de sangre, lo cual va a ser más caro para el paciente, va a tardar su tratamiento y no va a ser el correcto. So this wrong procedure by not following protocol will cause, it will be more costly to the patient, it will be uh, more, more blood tests or studies that the doctor is going to order, and then it's going to delay the proper management of the patient. And that is just why, because the phlebotomist, the doctor, the nurse, yes, you, did not follow protocols. I know it's not your fault because you're not properly trained. But if you don't do so, if you're not properly trained, don't do it because the patient pays the price. So once again, I'm talking about diabetes. But before I get into diabetes, because it's, it's, what I'm going to bring to you is really bad. You'll see, it's so bad that, that, that you won't believe it. And diabetes is very a bad disease. Not a very bad disease, a very bad club of a disease. Club, because the diabetes invite everything to your body, not in a good way. Okay, now, when we talk about pre-analytical errors, cuando hablamos de los errores pre-analíticos, mira cómo están los errores a nivel del mundo casi. Look how they are. All of that are pre-analytical errors all, all over the world. And this is not, look at this in, Arge, in Argentina, that they just won. Uh, and that was good, you know, in, in the soccer field. I think it was against France, I believe. Anyway, this is now in 2022, December 2022. So in our, they lost, uh, I think that Argentina won. But anyway, in Argentina, the pre-analytical errors are more than 70 percentage. In India, more than 77. In Italy, more than 68. Spain, around 75. United States, now up to 92. In Colombia, 88. And in my country, it's 100% plus. That is sad. So, in Argentina, we have errors penalíticos, 70% in India, 77% in Italy, 68% in Spain, more than 75% in the United States, hasta un 92%, aunque dice ahí 68 un 80% in Colombia, un 88%, y en mi país, el mío, República Dominicana, más de un 100%. ¿Y por qué digo en mi país? Porque yo hice ese estudio allá. Yo eh, eh, analicé tres hospitales grandes. El Robert Reed, lo sigo diciendo. El Hospital La Caoba, lo sigo diciendo. No, no, no. El Barcelino, en la capital. Y esos son hospitales buenos y que tienen muchos doctores buenísimos y enfermeras buenas, pero no hay protocolo. Independientemente, no creas que esto tan solo pasa 
el resultado de sangre. So, I, but I don't want you to think that having wrong results, errors, that only happens in blood testing. No! We have errors in diagnosis in America. Aquí en Estados Unidos tenemos errores en el diagnóstico médico. We have errors in ultrasound report, in x-rays report. We have errors in every field. So don't think that is in my country, Dominican Republic, in Colombia, in Guatemala, in El Salvador. Don't think that we only have mistakes. America has mistakes and it's worse. Why? Because in America, we have protocols that are, that are support, that is education, but we are not following. And this, you could look at it in, in JAMA, in the Journal of American Medical Association. And at the end, what happened? Esto usted lo puede buscar no tan solo eh, en el CLSI. Usted lo puede buscar en el, en el, en el Journal de, en the American Medical Association de la Asociación Americana, que también hay errores de diagnóstico médico aquí en los Estados Unidos, no tan solo en sangre, en sonografía, en radiografía, en cirugía, en diagnósticos, en, en medicina interna, en todo tenemos errores. En un país donde tenemos tanto protocolo, tantas guías, tanto soporte y tanta ayuda. ¿Y dónde está el problema? What is the problem? The problem is in education. Education. There's the problem. El problema está en educación, pero en mi país, cada vez que yo iba al laboratorio y preguntaba, ¿dónde está el, el, el manual de procedimiento? Si la licenciada lo tiene, ella es la única que tiene la llave. No, no ha llegado la licenciada. No, aquí no está eso. Eh, increíble. So, in my country, in Dominican Republic, when I used to ask the, the nurses or the lab technologies to show me the lab procedure manual, to show me uh, where are the protocols, they used to say normally, oh yes, it's in the cabinet, but only the, uh, the supervisor, the lab supervisor, she has the key. Or when she has the key, oh, they are in a meeting. Or right now we don't have it available, but yes, we do have it, lies. There is no protocols. There are no protocols. And if they are, I hope so. So that the health department, the Dominican Medical Association, the Dominican Medical College Association, every entity in Dominican Republic, put yourself and go there to stabilize protocols for the best of the patient care or health. But that's not happening anyway. So everybody want to get good money. Mi doctores en mi país quiere que le paguen bien. Pero no hay estudio, no hay ensayos, no hay protocolos, no siguen protocolos. Entonces, ¿para qué tú quieres que te paguen bien si tú no tienes apoyo? Mejor vamos a pedir dinero para la educación, pedir dinero para los protocolos, para dar mejor servicio y nosotros crecer en ciencia, dar mejor tratamiento y de esa forma vamos a exigir dinero. Porque sí, el doctor en casi en toda parte del mundo está mal pago, la enfermera peor todavía. Y los laboratoristas también. So, tenemos que dar conciencia de que todos los profesionales son buenos y que cada quien hace algo diferente. Y tenemos que apoyar a cada uno de ellos. Anyway, so this is just me being passionate because I love my field and I teach this. So let's continue. If I'm going to see a patient that normally comes uh, for evaluation, normally I do a physical. In that physical, we do electrocardiogram, we do the vital signs, we take some blood, we take some urine analysis. Uh, in my case, besides the regular urine analysis, I will do a urine toxicology in the Dominican Republic. I'm the only one approved to receive and do uh, toxicology exams. Normalmente, eh, nosotros cuando vemos un paciente regular, le tomamos sangre. Eh, le hacemos examen de orina regular y hacemos un examen de orina de toxicología que aquí en República Dominicana no existe. Yo tengo mi clínica está aprobada para hacer esto, trabajando con una, un laboratorio especial aprobado por la FDA para ver los niveles de toxicidad y de veneno que hay en tu cuerpo, solamente con un espécimen de orina. Independiente de eso, hacemos electrocardiograma, tus signos vitales y una buena historia médica. So, first, remember, you come in to see a doctor. 
the doctor is going to do a good history medical exam he's going to do a screening test he's going to do your blood work urine analysis urine toxicology and after we get all of that then we sit down and we talk and then we evaluate what we could see from a scientific point of view and from a clinical observation point of view and tactile point of view so una vez ya tengamos todos los resultados eh, nosotros empecemos a hacer una entrevista contigo y de acuerdo al resultado que vemos al preguntarte al evaluar tu historia médica y cuando vengan los resultados de sangre y de orina ahí es donde nosotros vamos a empezar a desarrollar un plan preventivo y al mismo tiempo para tratar lo que tú tienes para que tu salud esté mejor so once we have all of that then we start thinking about a preventive program treatment for you as well or in combination with your internal medicine doctor with your cardiologist with your nurse practitioner with your family doctor with your endocrinologist because this is all together this goes all together so remember first electrocardiogram physical history urine analysis blood test evaluation we we see them we talk to you we see what it is we look we wait for the blood test and the urine test result once all of that come then we're going to prepare a treatment that is not just going to be preventive but also it's going to be in conjunction working with your cardiologist endocrinologist neurologist oncologist family doctor internal medicine doctor any doctor because this goes hands in hand now if you see here this lavender tap tube not only we use it for a complete blood count but we also use it for another test when we're talking about diabetes it's called hemoglobin hg or h b a 1c okay hemoglobin a 1c this is one of the tests <clears throat> i'm sorry that we also do okay that test is going to tell me uh, exactly how your glucose levels has been for the past 120 days around so otro examen que hacemos nosotros con este tubo lavender se llama el, el examen de hemoglobina a1c ese examen de hemoglobina me dice cómo está tu, tu sangre tu glucosa circulando en el sistema circulatorio por lo pasado por aproximado 120 días ok es algo muy bueno it is something very good because it tells me how is the amount of glucose circulating in your red blood cells for the past 120 days ok normally when we suspect that a patient is diabetic and we're going to talk about that um, I want my patient to come in a fasting blood sugar or in a basal state. Normalmente, cuando mi paciente eh, viene porque yo sospecho que él tiene una diabetes, ok, le hacemos un examen de ayuna o de un estado basal. Esto significa que el paciente está sin comer, non per us, nothing by mouth between 6 to 12 hours so normally when the patient comes we want the patient to be in a fasting state so that we could take blood and, and when, we, when we talk about fasting meaning up to six hours if he's in a basal state it means that he has not been eating between six and twelve hours so eso es lo que nosotros queremos que nuestro paciente para la glucosa solamente o para triglicéridos o para enzimas cardíacas, que él esté en un estado basal, que esté en ayuna. Si no es para otra cosa, él no tiene que estar en ayuna. So, the patient has to be in a fasting or in a basal state, basically for glucose, for cardiac marker, for lipid marker. If, if I just want to know how your red blood cells, your white blood cells, your platelet, you don't need to be fasting, okay? That's an unnecessary risk. But guess what? In my country, in Dominican Republic, pero miren, Santo Domingo, todavía se saca sangre con jeringuilla. Con una jeringuilla. If I want to know if my patient is diabetic, 
I need to obtain the blood in a great tap tube. I cannot take the blood with syringe. Why not? Because the syringe has nothing inside to prevent glycolysis. ¿Por qué yo no quiero usar una jeringuilla? Porque la jeringuilla no tiene nada dentro para prevenir algo que se llama glicólisis. Para prevenir la glicólisis, glico significa glucosa. Glyco means glucose, and lysis means rupture of. La, la glicólisis significa glucosa, y lysis significa ruptura. Déjame tomarme mi té. Let me just take my tea. Remember, always my tea. I'm fasting, but I'm taking my tea so I could control my diabetes because I'm diabetic. So once I have something inside my tube that prevents glycolysis, that is known as anti-glycolytic agent. Lo que previene la glicólisis, que, las, que, la, que el azúcar se, se, se rompa, se quema, se gaste, es un agente antiglicolítico que se conoce como potasio, it is known as potasio oxalate sodium fluoride. Ese potasio oxalato de fluoruro de sodio es el único que previene la glicólisis. Y guess what? That's not inside the syringe. It's inside, it's inside only the great tap tube. ¿Y qué, qué, ¿Y qué tú crees? Esto que evita la glicólisis solamente está en el tubo de la tapa gris. So, if they are taking your blood with syringe, they are contributing already to a wrong or inaccurate test result in terms of your glucose level. ¿Ok? So, si a ti te sacan la sangre con una jeringuilla, ya ellos están contribuyendo a que el resultado del azúcar que te da el doctor no es el tuyo, porque ya en una hora bajó más de 45% por no estar en el tubo gris. So, once we get the color tap tube, the, the gray tap tube, that is the only one for glucose testing, to know what is the glucose in your body system, okay? And there is a question that everybody needs to understand. This tube that you see here, let me see if I, right here, this tube right here, you have to invert in a 180 degree, like this, like this, like this, like this. That means one inversion. If you do this, you are agitating and it's going to be wrong the test result. All right? So normally, this mark that you see here, okay, is where we have where we have to put the blood up to, so that the amount of additive and anti-glycolytic agent is mixed with the proportion of the blood volume, and it does not create dilution. So, si uno no llena el tubo hasta donde está la marquita, como aquí te lo dice, okay ya no va a haber un radio apropiado del aditivo anticoagulante, agente antiglicolítico y la sangre, el volumen de sangre y por ende te va a dar una dilución es decir, que va a haber o mucho aditivo o muy poca sangre o mucha sangre o muy poco aditivo y eso causa un resultado erróneo and, nor and normally we have to invert this tube 8 to 10 times so that will be 1 2 3 not like this That is not, that is not inversion. That is not inversion. Okay? This is the proper inversion. 90 degree angle, 90 degree angle. 90 degree angle, 90 degree angle. Así es como se invierte apropiadamente. No así. Eso es shaking, ni así tampoco, ni así tampoco. Eso está incorrecto. Now, When one of the physical exams that we normally order is called CHEM 7. Let me write it down here. CHEM. CHEM 7. Why do we call it CHEM 7? Easily. 
because we have one analyte sodium potassium chlorine we have co2 or bicarbonate and then we have b u n creatinine and then glucose so all of that look one two three four five six and seven that's what they call it can seven okay eh, cuando le hacemos un examen de rutina de química que le decimos química 7 por ejemplo ahí eso equivale al sodio al potasio al cloro al bicarbonato al blood urea nitrógeno nit urea nitrógeno en sangre ok a la creatinina y a la glucosa eso en combinación con el hemograma el complete blood count this in combination with a complete blood count and, and urine analysis is basically what normally everybody looks as a standard so eso es lo que normalmente uno busca como estándar vamos a borrar the problem el problema es que los doctores y las enfermeras no saben porque no lo educan para eso y muchos asistentes médicos the problem with the nurses and doctors and nurse practitioners and many medical assistants that don't know that they are not aware because they're not properly trained is that with this tube that we call it the gold tube the tiger SST speckle marble este tubo tiene diferentes números el tubo de la tapa rojo y gris el tubo con la tapa oro el de gelatina el tigre el de mármol this tube has inside something that is known as a clot activator este tubo tiene esa gelatina that gel that is inside the tube that gel here that gel is a clot activator but there is a misperception with this clot activator hay una mala percepción con este activador de coágulo es que todo el mundo cree que esto activa el coágulo eso no activa el coágulo this allow for all the steps in the coagulation cascade to occur at the time that it's supposed to be este clot activator este activador de coágulo lo que ayuda es a que los pasos de coagulación la cascada se vayan uno a uno pasando en la forma como tiene que pasar bajo circunstancias normales and this takes between 20 to 30 minutes y esto toma normalmente entre 20 a 30 minutos para que esto ocurra por eso cuando uno toma ese tubo cuando uno saca sangre en ese tubo uno tiene que esperar entre 20 a 30 minutos antes de centrifugar so because of that between 20 and 30 minutes that this whole sequence of coagulation will occur that's when we wait before we centrifuge Let me take my tea. So before we take, we, before we centrifuge. Very good. So, ¿y por qué tenemos que hacer eso antes de centrifugar? Porque si centrifugamos antes de que el coágulo haya pasado todo esto, me va a dar a otro resultado erróneo. Y con los electrolitos, y con el potasio, y con el sodio, y con el chloride, y con el bicarbonate, con todo me va a dar resultado erróneo. So, if I don't do that, if I don't wait my 20 to 30 minutes before I centrifuge, all this electrolyte will come with errors, errors that we cannot change it. Okay? So, let me erase. So, esos errores no se pueden arreglar después. Después que el error está hecho, no lo cambia nadie. So, the same thing, okay? Every tube, everyone, without exception, have to be inverted into 180 degrees. Sin excepción, todos los tubos tienen que invertirse en 180 grados. Sin, sin excepción. Y recuérdate, and remember, that is 90 plus 90. 90 plus 90. 90 plus 90. Okay? That is one inversion. Remember, there is a mark where you have to fill the tube up. 
Hay una marca que tú tienes que llenar el tubo. ¿Ok? And we're going to invert that five to eight times. ¿Ok? Why we have to invert? To allow the blood to get exposed to this either taxotropic gel or silicon-based gel to, to not to accelerate, but to induce the clot information. So, uno invierte esto para hacer que esta gelatina tixotrópica o de silicona pues pueda estar en contacto con los glóbulos rojos, con los glóbulos blancos, con la plaqueta e iniciar el proceso de la cascada de coagulación internamente. Now, independent of that, I, I have seen many, many phlebotomists or doctors that as soon as they take the blood, they centrifuge right away. No, don't do that. The clotting do not accelerate the timing. It makes sure that the clot occurs. Two different things. So, recuerda este doctor que está allá o enfermera. Cuando tú sacas sangre con ese tubo gol, tú no centrifugas inmediatamente. Tú esperas entre 20 a 30 minutos. Que sea un activador de coágulo es una cosa. Y que haga el proceso completo es otra. Por eso hay que esperar de 20 a 30 minutos. But also, many times we don't have enough blood in the tube. Which is known as quantity not sufficient. Meaning that if I have too much additive and anticoagulant and less blood, it's going to yield a test result that is wrong. If you have too much blood and too less additive and anticoagulant, you're still going to have dilution. You're going to have an effect. You're going to have a bad things on the blood test result. So, tenemos que llenar todos los tubos sin excepciones. Todos. Para que no haya un efecto dilucional y no de un resultado erróneo. Eso no queremos nosotros como ustedes están viendo aquí. So, esto que ustedes ven aquí, this that you see here, is what we see, que okay, once the whole blood is divided. We have the plasma, which is the liquid portion of blood. I'm going to put everything there so that you can see. Yo voy a poner todo aquí para que ustedes vean. Todo esto es lo que nosotros evaluamos cuando hacemos las cosas correctamente. All of this is what we evaluate when we do things correctly. All right? So, this liquid portion has a lot of information. The red blood cells has a lot of information. The, uh, the, the coded here, that's where we have the white blood cells, and that's where we have the platelet. So, we use all of that to study everything. Okay? And if you don't follow proper procedure, we are going to be giving you the test results that is not. And that is the reason why, perhaps, in not only in diabetes, but also in every disease, all the problems that we have, that will give you therapy and it doesn't work. Why? Maybe because we have the test result that is wrong and we are reacting on a test result that is wrong. So before I start talking about this, I'm just letting you know all the problem that happens before the blood gets analyzed in the pre-analytical phase. So, todo esto que estoy diciendo to es todo lo que puede pasar antes de que la sangre llegue a ser analizada. ¿Te fijas? So, hay que ir a un lugar o con profesionales certificados, apropiadamente certificados, por agencias de verdad que tienen estándar y escuelas que de verdad siguieron protocolos correctos. So, by you going to a proper doctor, a proper lab, in which they're phlebotomies or lab technologies are well credentialed, have a good education, we are going to reduce all these errors that we have. And this is all before the blood gets analyzed. Now, technology is beautiful. With technology, we do a lot of good stuff. En tecnología hacemos muchas cosas bien. Quiero decir que yo no trabajo para para ninguna compañía de lo que yo vaya a estar mostrando. I want to say to you that I have no conflicts of interest. I don't work for none of these companies that I'm presenting information. This is just for educational purposes. But I want you to know this. This is what we call a histogram, in which a machine, once we put the blood tube inside, okay, it will determine how many white blood cells, how many red blood cells and how many platelets we have. That's what it does. 
quiero decirle que yo no tengo ningún conflicto de interés, puesto que no trabajo con ninguna de estas compañías que voy a mencionar aquí. Esto es para educación propia. Pero mira esto. Esta es una máquina donde normalmente la tecnología que es muy buena, ¿ok? Tú llegas al tubito de sangre, por ejemplo, tu tubito de sangre, ¿ok? This is like your blood tube. You're going to put it inside there. Ok, I'm going to mark it so you can see it. You're going to put that tube here. See? And then the machine is going to suck up, it's going to draw it up, and then it's going to do the analysis. Entonces la máquina, cuando pones el tubo ahí, donde está esa flechita roja, la sangre va a entrar y la máquina va a evaluar los glóbulos rojos, los glóbulos blancos y la plaqueta. ¿Cómo hace eso? How, how this machine recognize that this is a red blood cells, that this is a platelet, and this is a, a, a white blood cells? By their size. They cannot see. They just measure it by their size. Ellos no ven esto. La máquina no sabe cuál es cuál, pero por el tamaño del glóbulo rojo, por el tamaño de la plaqueta, por el tamaño de los glóbulos blancos, él puede decir, este es tal cosa, este es tal cosa. Precioso, beautiful. But guess what? For example, so that you have an idea. If you use a butterfly, let me see. A mariposa. Si tú usas una mariposa, dame ver así, así, ahí. Si tú usas una mariposa, si tú usas una jeringuilla, ¿ok? Si tú usas la aguja apropiada, esta es la aguja apropiada para sacar sangre. Voy a ver si lo hago correcto, así. Un poquito más para atrás. Ahí. A little, ok, ahí. This is the proper needle that we use exactly to draw blood for Benny Puncher. You never recap, I'm just doing this to practice, okay? Usted nunca la tapa así, usted puede pullar, okay? Now, ¿qué es lo que pasa? What is what happened? Normally, normally, which I'm beginning to think that that's wrong, in one of the protocols from CLSI, it says that you don't take blood with butterfly. En los protocolos de, CS, de CLSI dice que uno no puede sacar sangre con mariposa. Pero yo estoy empezando a dudar eso. Porque en mi hospital hay muchos flebotomistas que sacan sangre con mariposa. Incluyendo a mí que lo he hecho en circunstancias especiales. Y yo no he visto una, una hemólisis. Y he preguntado a los lab tecnólogos y no ha habido hemólisis. And I have seen with many patients in ICU that have taken the blood with butterfly that my patient's blood test result, my, 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 the quality of the specimen has no hemolysis. That's in my hospital. So I'm, now I'm going to do another search. I'm going to study on this. I'm going to do a research on this to see if it's true that the butterflies are the reason why uh, we have hemolysis. Voy a hacer un estudio ahora porque estoy mirando que muchos pacientes, muchos tecnólogos sacan sangre con mariposa y no hay hemólisis. So, ¿dónde estará el problema? We're going to see that. But guess what? If we break the red blood cells, these are the red blood cells. Estos son los glóbulos rojos. Estas son las plaquetas. Ok. So, if we break the red blood cells and then the red blood cells are smaller, the machine will not call it red blood cell. They will call it something else. So, si yo causo una hemólisis con los glóbulos rojos, how do I cause hemólisis? You see this? If I do this, that's it. I'm breaking the red blood cells. They are very sensitive. They're very, they're very uh, 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 delicate. If you just do this, you broke the red blood cells. So, you have to be gentle, and that's why you have to invert. Okay? So, if let's say you have seven red blood cells, and when you shake it, now you have only, let's say, three. That is what the test result is going to be reported. But is that what you have? You don't have that. So, si uno coge una aguja y causa hemólisis, o uno le hace esto al tubo y rompe los glóbulos rojos, y tú tenías, por ejemplo, siete, y nada más te quedan tres buenos, la máquina va a reportar ¿cuánto? Tres. Pero fue verdad, es verdad que tú solamente tienes tres glóbulos rojos. No, tú no tienes eso. Eso es un error. ¿Causado por quién? Por el que sacó la sangre. The same, the same way, if by any chance, these platelets, because you did this, you activated them, they come together. 
okay? Let's say that they come together, okay? That, if they come together, like this, this one gets over here, this one gets over here, and over here, and over here. Now their size are bigger. Now the machine is not going to call a platelet. It's going to call a replo cell. But also to your platelet that was, let's say, seven, now you have only five or three, it's going to say that you have a low platelet count. So, cuando uno no hace la inversión correcta y agita o agita demasiado, las plaquetas se ponen juntas, se, se aglomeran juntas, y ahora tienen el tamaño de un glóbulo rojo. ¿Y qué tú crees que la máquina va a decir? La máquina va a decir, este tiene otro glóbulo rojo. Pero la plaqueta te va a dar un conteo menor. Y ahora dice que tú tienes una trombocitopenia o una baja en plaqueta. ¿Y eso es lo que tú tienes? No. ¿Eso fue un error de quién? Del flebotomista o de cualquiera que sacó la sangre y no siguió los protocolos. So, again, if the doctor did not invert, if the nurse did not invert, anyone that took the blood that did not invert, what's going to happen? You're going to get thrombocytopenia. You're going to get that the playlists are going to get activated. They get together. They look bigger. And then the machine, we count it as platelet. No, as red blood cells because of the size. Remember, the machine cannot differentiate between platelet. White blood cells, red blood cells. They are only looking to the size. How do they know? Because over here, they have a sensing receptor that as soon as it passes through them, according to their size, that's how they could differentiate between red, white, and platelet. So estas dos placas que tú ves aquí son sensores. Y a medida que van pasando los glóbulos rojos, los glóbulos blancos y la plaqueta, pues esta mide el tamaño y así es como clasifica. Ya te puedes dar cuenta el por qué hay tantos errores en la producción analítica, pero porque ya vino por un problema preanalítico. So it does not matter. From which school, college you graduated, the best college that you graduated, if you were properly, improperly trained, what you're coming out is with improper skills. Si el espécimen que tú sacaste se sacó en el mejor lugar del mundo, pero no tenía protocolo, no se hizo la cosa correcta, cuando llega al laboratorio lo que llega es un disparate. ¿Y qué es lo que tú vas a reportar? Otro disparate. ¿Y quién va a pagar los platos? El paciente. Porque el doctor se va a llevar de esto y va a hacer su tratamiento de acuerdo a eso. Y ahí está el problema. ¿Y por qué tenemos tantos problemas hoy en día? And that is the biggest problem on why we have so much problem. ¿Ok? So, if I'm going to show you, for example, um, Hold on. Give me one second. I'm trying to change my next slide. So this is the next slide that I was trying to show you, okay? Okay. Again, my T, guys. And I'm going to put this one as a part one so that you understand before I get into the diabetes why this is important and why I'm going to make a series in diabetes so that we are more aware. Y esta la voy a hacer la parte número uno. Para que todos entendamos, antes de entrar a la enfermedad, de dónde vienen tantos errores y por qué tenemos tantos medicamentos, tantos tratamientos que no están trabajando. En medicina, en todo el mundo. So, because they are not working, because the medication are not working, they have to be a problem. So we have to start from the beginning, from my point of view. So these that I'm showing you here are the catheter. This here is the catheter. These here are the butterfly. Estos son el catheter y este es el, la mariposa. ¿Por qué hay problemas con esto? Why do we have problems with this? In first place, catheters were not meant to draw blood. They are not meant to draw blood. Las mariposas no se crearon para sacar sangre. I know, mis mi, 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 mi letras son... A mí me da miedo. 
I know even my draw, my, 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 my handwriting is, is messed up. But what I'm saying is that butterfly and catheter, they were not meant to draw blood. That's, that was not what they were created. They were created to infuse, to infuse, to put. A, ellos fueron caros para poner líquidos, sangre, lo que sea, no para sacar. So cuando nosotros tenemos las agujas, la punta, el shaft, el bevel, todo eso, toda esta parte que está aquí corta, yo te lo voy a enseñar ahora, más grande. All of this cut. So they, are, they were created, manufactured to put IV, to put fluid, to put medication. They were not created to draw blood. To, ellos no estaban creados para sacar sangre, sino para poner. Por lo tanto, en la estructura que hay, que te la voy a enseñar ahora, cada vez que tú usas uno de estos, por ciencia, ellos van a romper. Déjame ponértelo para que tú lo veas. Let me just put it so that you can see it. Hold on a second. Why? They are only meant to infuse. They were not meant to draw. Okay, guys. This is what I was uh, telling you. Okay, so if you see, okay, let me just mark it again. This part over here, all of this, this little pointed here, we call that shaft. Esa punta ahí es la que corta. Y toda esta parte que está aquí también corta. So all of this part over here, this is something that you cannot really see. You have to put it through a microscope. Look, all of these vascular access device, catheters, butterfly, okay? Todo esto catheter, mariposa, se le llama acceso, eh, equipo de acceso vascular. Fíjate que todo esto que está aquí, todo esto corta. All of that cut, you see that? They are not the same. They are all different. See? So once this was created, this was not created to, to, to draw blood. This just created to infuse, to put things in. But as soon as you start moving from side to side, you're cutting tissue. And that's how you create hematoma, black and blue. So estas, estas terminaciones de las agujas fueron creadas para poner líquido, no para sacar. Fíjate que no todas son iguales. Y cuando el flebotomista está moviéndote de la agujita de lado a lado, de lado a lado, para arriba, para abajo, para arriba, para abajo, te está cortando tejido. Y por eso ahí hay hematomas bajo circunstancias indirectas. So, when you do all that, okay, this is just to show you that they are not just one type and that's it. This was meant to infuse, not to take blood out. And when you start moving that, from up and down, side to side, what are you doing is cutting tissue. That's going to create a hematoma. There are circumstances in which you have to do it. Of course, I understand. Because when you put an IV, it's totally different than when you draw blood. The same protocol that we use for making to put an IV is not the same protocol that we use when we take blood. So, uno de los errores que hay es que la gente cree que el poner un suero es lo mismo que poner que sacar sangre y no lo es. Los protocolos que usamos nosotros para nosotros sacar sangre no es lo mismo protocolo para nosotros a uh, poner un suero. So, por ende, no crean ustedes que aquel que sabe poner un suero va a tener calidad si no tiene educación para obtener un buen espécimen de sangre. So, because of that, if we don't have a good a uh, person that is uh, educated properly, that not, not only knows how to put an IV, but is also educated in phlebotomy, then you will have a good quality specimen, which is going to be more close to what really is your condition and the doctor be able to have a good management on your, on your health issue. But let me just say something. There is a new technology. That new technology is called PIVO. It's called PIVO Vascular. Pero deben decirle que hay una tecnología nueva que se llama pivo vascular. La pueden buscar, creo que Beck and Dickinson tiene eso. Ok, so what is this pivo vascular? Well, it is a set of a specific um, 
uh, another device that you could put inside the IV lumen, inside the catheter, and it will not cut, cut hemolysis, it will not cause hemolysis, and you could draw blood. But only if you have that pivovascular technology. So, hay una tecnología nueva que cuando uno tiene una línea intravenosa con un equipo específico que hay que se pone dentro de la línea, tú sí puedes sacar sangre evitando eh, eh, pullar al paciente de nuevo y, causa, y evitar causar una hemólisis. Por eso se llama PIVO. No todos los hospitales lo tienen, ni todas las enfermeras lo saben, ni los asistentes médicos, ni los flebotomistas. Inclusive hay doctores que ni saben de lo que estoy hablando. Ok, guys. So, with this, I'm going to finish by just showing you what a complete blood count does. Okay? So, a complete blood count tells me everything about red blood cells. That the scientific proper name for red blood cells is red corpuscle because they have no nucleus. They lose that as they grow in, as they mature. Then we have the white blood cells or leukocytes. Then we have the platelets or thrombocyte. So, with vascular access device, with butterfly, according to CLSI, document GP41, they said that we cannot use butterfly. But I'm doubting that as we speak. I'm going to do a research on that because I have seen many of my blood specimen that I have taken in ICU and do not cause hemolysis. So, Esto es lo que un hemograma o un conteo completo de la sangre eh, eh, representa todo lo que tiene que ver con glóbulos rojos, que se le llama científicamente a la célula corpúsculo rojo, porque este no tiene núcleo. Los glóbulos blancos y las plaquetas. Entonces, hoy en día yo voy a investigar porque eh, el documento GP41 del de CLSI dice que no se debe usar mariposas o accesos vasculares como el catéter, pero porque causa hemólisis, es decir, que rompe el glóbulo rojo en dos. Pero ¿qué es lo que yo he estado mirando? Que yo he sacado sangre en pacientes en cuidado intensivo y yo no veo que ocurra esto con el laboratorio tecnólogo. Le pregunto y me dice que no, que estuvo bien. So, mi pregunta tal vez será, ¿será que la hemólisis ocurre no tan solo por no tener una buena técnica? y no seguir los protocolos como van de inversión y de transportación, eh, vamos a ver. Anyway, con esta parte los dejo y, de, y ahora voy a crear una parte 2 que es hablando ya específicamente de la diabetes. Ya sabemos todos los errores que pueden venir por no seguir protocolos. Now we have an idea of all the problems in test results that may come when no one blood drop, drop blood in the proper way. And I really want you to understand that because in the next part, I'm going to be talking about diabetes and the management and all the things that goes along when we suspect that you have that you are a diabetic. Espero que esto les haya gustado. Vuelvo eh, muy pronto ahora con la parte 2 de las series de diabetes. Ok, cuídense. Espero que me den buenos comentarios y buenas preguntas. Una vez más, Dante Joa. Thank you very much. I hope you have learned the importance of a phlebotomist or someone that knows how to take blood with protocols because it will also help in your blood test result in your management and how fast you could become or overcome whatever metabolic condition that you are going through. Please subscribe to my channel and share it with many people. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias por estar aquí conmigo. Espero que hayan aprendido. Lo importante de es tener una persona profesional, académicamente educada en la parte de extracción de sangre y cómo esto interviene con el manejo de tu salud y tu condición. Si no eres miembro, mejor dicho, si no, si no estás conmigo todavía, suscríbete, por favor, me ayudas y dale un share. Compártelo con otros. ¿Ok? Pase un buen día, encantado. Mi nombre es Dante Joa.